All right, 10th grade, Miss Boyd here with chapters 9 through 12 of the yearly. So, we're starting off with chapter 9, and it talks about um, the abundance of food and things like that because of spring and summer and all those things, everything growing. And it talks about his father finding a string, strange object in the trap and come to find out it's an albino raccoon. So, um, of course, Jody feels terrible that it's dead. And, of course, his father does too. But they decide to skin it and keep it. And Jody's going to make a knapsack out of it. Okay? So, they talk about in this chapter a lot water. Okay? So, um, Jody promises his father that he'll clean the water troughs. Okay? And it talks about that they've lived there on Baxter's Island for 20 years and they still don't have a well, okay? And that's one thing that Penny feels terrible about because he promised Laura or Ma Baxter that they would eventually get a well there and they wouldn't have to worry about water. So it's almost like any time they go to where the troughs are um, and they fill up the water buckets and it says that Penny has a yoke across his shoulders and it has the water in the buckets on both sides. It's almost like he's paying penance for his sin of not getting the water for his wife. So they go out to the sinkhole and first Jody goes while Penny's skinning the raccoon and it describes the sinkhole to you. It's a huge bowl. It's been there forever. It has a trail because the Baxters have kind of made their way over the past 20 years, created one. It talks about the different troughs that they've created in the side. Uh, ones for their animals, ones for washing clothes, ones for drinking out of, okay? And it says, of course, since it's water, and it's like an underground river that keeps it um, moist and wet, it is a place that has life all around it, okay? So they talk about gathering water there, um, and... Um, goes through and describes all the animals and the plants and everything that are around. And as they're, as Jody's there by himself, eventually Penny gets there. And his son asks him why they moved out in the middle of nowhere. And his father tells him that he just craved peace. Okay. Um, and for him, he can understand animals more than he can understand people which is foreshadowing a little bit for you. And if you finish the four chapters, you can kind of see why. So they're going through and looking around and they see like a raccoon out there. And um, they talk about why some creatures are bold and some aren't. And of course, Penny hasn't really figured that one out. And then again, at the very end of this chapter, Jody says, Pa, I wish I had me something to pet and play with like fodder wing. And Penny says, you know how your ma rares. I wouldn't mind it. I love creatures, but times have been hard and rations are scarce. And your ma is the one to say. So Penny, tell, I mean, she, he's got the dogs, but they also work. But he loves the idea of creatures and having a pet. But the problem is when you have something like that, you also have to have the means to take care of it. The Baxters don't. The Foresters do. Okay. And then at the end, they talk about which animals are easiest to tame. And, um, of course, at the very end, he says, you can tame anything except the human tongue. And chapter 10 starts off with Jody being sick and having a fever. And this is the first time you really see Ma Baxter's caring side. And she gives him all these different remedies to try to make sure he doesn't have something that will kill him like the measles. And eventually you figure out he doesn't. So he goes back out and he talks to his father and they decide they're going to go fishing for cattywampus, which is just catfish. Okay. So uh, they get ready to go on their trip. They have some food. They bring their poles and all that kind of stuff and their rigs. And they go around and they see the Menorcans, which is um, people of Spanish descent. And, it, um, of course, Jody wants to see more about them, but their father says they've had it rough. They live in a poor area where it's hard to live. There's not a lot of life in the land. So, of course, Penny says to leave them alone. And they go around to these different 
ponds and pennies throwing grasshoppers to see if there's any life in there. And then eventually they get to a, a pond where there's life. So Jody watches his father with, with expert cast and he's just kind of wishes he could be like him. That, that's what this moment's all about is he just kind of envies how his father is so good at hunting and fishing and all these different things that, you know, Jody loves. And then as he's trying to fish on his own, he, he makes a really good cast and then he realizes his father is watching him. And he lands a really big fish, and you'll notice Penny leaves him to it, and he lets him struggle with every ounce of it, because if he doesn't, his son will never learn how to do all these things on his own. You're noticing a lot of this in this, I mean, you see it here with the fishing, you see it in the next chapter when they go hunting and go to the store in Volusia. He wants his son to learn, so he lets his son struggle with it, figure out how to land the fish, and of course he does. And then his father is like, well, I got to find me a fish just as good. And you'll notice in this bit, he catches lots of fish, but he's not going to take home fish just because he catches it. He only takes what he needs and then leaves everything else or puts everything else back. And then at the end of this chapter, you have this scene with the whooping cranes that they're watching. And for them, it's a moment that's not seen often in nature. It's like one of those moments that people tell stories about. And you know how great Penny is at telling stories. And now Jody has a story of his own that he can tell. And it's a moment um, in nature that they kind of share as father and son. Um, and it's something that they've never seen anything like. So, of course, they both are enthralled with it. Now, chapter 11. <clears throat> um, it's It starts off by Jody talking uh, to his mother about if he could find a fawn and keep it for himself. And of course, Ma is totally against it because it cuts into their rations of food. So <clears throat> in um, this little section, although he, he's still bickering with, with his mother, uh, Penny listens, but he's not going to speak up against Ma Baxter on that. So in this moment, Penny kind of realizes that... Uh, He's got to go get some things from the store in Volusia. So it talks about gun shells, coffee, etc. And he's going to take Jody with him. And they can go hunting, kill a deer, and then use the money from the deer meat and the hide to trade for things in the store. And of course, she doesn't want them to go. Uh, one reason is she's left without a man at the house. So she wants Jody to stay there. But Penny's like, He's got to learn how to hunt and how to trade and how to do all those things. And also in Volusia is where you have Grandma Hutto. And then in here, you can tell Ma Baxter and Grandma Hutto do not get along. So um, Penny promises they, they'll come back the next day. And then they go on their trip. And they go hunting. And in this scene, you can tell how much Penny knows and how much Jody has to learn. Um, from uh, knowing where uh, the deer are going to come back and forth to where there's a little fawn hiding and Jody gets to see it up in the tree. His father knew it was there the whole time. Um, there's a lot. I mean, even to the deer tracks, knowing whether it's a male or a female, the spots on the fawn, whether it's male or female, like Penny knows all of it. And Jody has a ton of it to learn from his father. So eventually they kill a buck. Um, Jody hits it first and Penny finishes it off and they skin it and then they take it on to Volusia. Okay. And once they get there, um, and, and as they're walking, you have this little section where, um, Penny kind of teases his son um, and it talks about you lately, this girl that he likes. And then of course, Jody immediately is like, no, I don't. Uh, the only girl I like is grandma Hutto. And you can kind of see him teasing his son all the way there. So eventually they get to the store and that's where you meet Mr. Boyles, who's in charge of the store. And you can see Penny and Mr. Boyles have a great relationship. Um, they trade and he even lets Jody, um, have something uh and he chooses the mouth organ which is more than the dime but he lets him have it anyways because they don't come that often 
and <clears throat> you have uh, you lately come in there because she's Mr. Boyle's niece. And in that moment, <laughs> Jody snaps and throws a potato at her. And of course, Penny is totally embarrassed, makes him give the mouth heart back. And they leave. And um, of course, Jody's like, oh, I hate her. I don't care. And then when um, <laughs> Penny threatens to tell Grandma Hutto, he's like, oh, don't tell her I did that. Don't tell her. She'd be so disappointed. <laughs> so eventually they get to Grandma Hutto's house. It says it's beautiful. It has um, bright flowers everywhere. Um, honeysuckle, jasmine. And these are things, plants that are planted for beauty and for smell, not for eating and things like that. So here's another difference between the Baxters and Grandma Hutto. Everything the Baxters plant, they have a use for. Grandma Hutto is more similar to the Foresters. I mean, the Foresters plant things that they use, but her stuff, just like with Fodderwing's pets, she has things for comfort, not for use. So... They run up and give her a hug. They describe her um, as joyful. Her eyes were as black as gallberries. She's pink and wrinkled. She has silver curls in her hair. And um, Jody just absolutely loves her and the way she smells and everything about her. And it says that she had this innate ability to make men young and old just feel better, like they're better versions of themselves. And... So they bring her the meat. Jody sees her dog, Fluff. Um, and again, just a tiny little uh, white dog that's just there for comfort. And it says Jody felt more at home than when he returned home to his own mother. So this woman is the soft side of a woman. Uh, Ma Baxter is harsh and... She almost kind of has to be because of where they live and what she's experienced. Grandma Hutto is the opposite. So he gets to go swimming. He doesn't have to work. Um, they go inside. She has clean clothes for him. She lets him lie around. She has everything from sweet lavender, dried grasses, pastry, honey, tarts, fruit cakes, flowers, spice cakes. She's got everything and she doesn't lack for anything. She has the extras that the Baxters aren't used to at their home. And so they snuggle in there, um, they feel comfortable, and it's just totally different from home because they don't have chores and work that they have to worry about. And then, of course, um, you have Penny tease Grandma Hutto about her sweetheart, which is Easy Ozell, and um, Easy Ozell is a Yankee, which is one reason she won't have anything to do with them. And he's not the most attractive man. I mean, he's described as a sick gray crane with feathers draggled by the rain. He has his hair gray and that's long and wispy. He has a thin mustache that droops all over his jaws. And he's not the most attractive thing, but he will do anything and everything for Grandma Hutto. He comes over and does the manly chores around the house for her. Although... Grandma Hutto doesn't necessarily give him the time of day. So you go through here and um, you have Jody tell Grandma, Lim Forrester said Twink Weatherby was his gal. I said she was Oliver's and Lim didn't like it at all. And she says Oliver will likely take care of that when he gets home if a Forrester knows to fight fair. So again, you have this idea that the Foresters, Oliver, Twink Weatherby are going to be a big deal. And then it's also the idea of which which side is Jody going, going to take. He has no clue and he's never had to do that before. So at the very end of this, you see Jody say, I wish grandma was really my grandma. And I wish Oliver really was kin, that they really were a family. So you find out they aren't necessarily blood family but there are people in your lives that are close enough to be your family. And that's what Grandma uh, Hutto and Oliver are. So chapter 12, Oliver comes home. He get to meet him. He's handsome, charismatic. Um, and you see, like, he's hung the moon as far as Grandma Hutto is concerned. 
and it says he only comes home twice a year. So, of course, she's so excited to get the breakfast on, everything out, and it goes through the presents he brings back from um, something for Twink or a, a beautiful knife for Jody for when he goes hunting, nice tobacco for Penny, and, um, of course, you have this little section where, again, Jody just almost, it's kind of like he has to get it off his chest and off of his conscience what Lim Forrester said about Twink. And Oliver just laughs like it's not a big deal. And he says, no Forrester ever told the truth. So again, are they good or are they not good? Which Forresters are good? Which ones aren't? And so they sit there and they have their breakfast. Grandma doesn't even eat because she's so enthralled with Oliver. And... um they have their conversations, uh, picking at Jody, and of course, he doesn't mind it as long as he's around people that he loves that won't pick back at him in a negative way, like the foresters might. <clears throat> they talk about uh, that he'll grow up good looking, and he'll eventually get a sweetheart, and they tease him about you lately again. And, um, and in this little section, it talks about Ma a little bit, and how she's kind of harsh. And Grandma Hutta says she don't appreciate, and this is Pa, um, she just don't know any better. A woman has got to love a bad man once or twice in her life to be thankful for a good one. And, of course, Penny's kind of blushing about that, but it talks about that Grandma Hutta knows how good of a man Penny truly is. And so in the next little section, you have Oliver going to leave for a little bit to go see Twink. That's really what he's going to do. And then, um, although Penny doesn't want to because Oliver's there, he knows he's got to get home because he's pro he promised Ma to. And then it didn't take very long. Um, here comes Easy eventually coming up there, and he says, Oliver's fighting the Foresters, and they're killing him. So um, they don't tell Grandma, and then Penny and Jody basically run to help Oliver. And Jody says, Pa, you said no man could couldn't live on Baxter Island without the Forester, without the Foresters was his friends. So basically, even Jody knows that this is a big deal because for them to, to survive on Baxter's Island, they need the Forester's help. They need someone close by that they can go to for help. Um, and Pa said, I said so, but he's not willing to see Oliver hurt over it either. So they get there in the middle of Volusia, of Volusia, the town. Everybody's watching. Nobody's stepping in to help Oliver, and it's three against one. Again, reiterating what Grandma Hutta said, that they don't know how to fight fair. And so Penny tries his best to split it up because literally they are killing Oliver. Three of them against one, and none of them are going to back down. And so Penny tries to tell him, you got Who's this fight between? You got to fight fair. Three against one isn't fair. And of course, they're not willing to do that. And then at the very end, it says um, that all Jody saw was Penny's arm swinging. And he says, It was close at first, then it faded. He dropped into blackness. And that's how it ends with this fight. And then between the Foresters, Oliver and the Baxters. And you know, in this moment, it's forever going to change the dynamic between the Baxters and the Foresters and how the Baxters have to live on their island. It will affect everything. And those are your four chapters.